Now, um, I don't have enough time to talk about this, but you can read about it in my article on Hadood called Stoning and Handcutting at YaqeenInstitute.org. This is what my previous talk was about. Uh, Hadood crimes, their evidentiary ba bar is so high that in effect, their punishments never actually happen. Uh, why do you have rules? Why do you have punishments that are set that, never, that almost never actually happen? Because the, um, the aim is to deter people. In pre-modern states, you don't have police forces that can go and like walk the beat or investigate crimes. States don't have that manpower. They don't have the administrative capacity. So basically, in order to deter people, you have to have very high punishments, very severe punishments. But you don't actually want to implement those punishments. So you have like ways out of the punishment that we, where you make it very hard to prove that the crime actually occurred. This is the same in uh, actually British law prior to the, 19, to the late 19th century and in other legal systems as well. You can even see this in kind of ancient Near Eastern law. So most of the things that, you know, uh, theft or ac accusations of zina and things like that, they're almost never going to be dealt with in Hadood level. They're going to be dealt with in what's called tazir, which is the discretionary punishment of the judge. And sometimes this tazir is set by the medheb, or sometimes it's set by the state. So in the case of the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire actually had these things called yasakh names, which are books that set the different punishments for different for crimes. I talked about some of these before. Some of them are interesting. You steal a chicken, you have to walk around with that chicken like around your neck, get paraded through the village, like, ha, look who stole the chicken, right? <laughs> you have, if you are a, uh, oh, I'll just use that one as an example, right? Um, and actually, I'll bring this up with my mom as well, because one of the things that is a, a very typical Tazir punishment, especially in the Ottoman period, is what's called bastinado. And this is where you hit someone's bottom of their feet with a, with a reed. And I remember once we were, my mom and I were cleaning out this closet in my sister's room, and we found this like kind of long reed. It looked like a really thin, long back scratcher or something. And my mom was like, oh, that looks like a bastinado reed. And I said, I was like, what's that? She said, oh, you hit bottom of the feet with that. I said, that's, that's pathetic. This wouldn't hurt at all. She said, okay, try it out. So I lay back in the bed, and she just whacked me once on the bottom of my feet. It really hurt a lot. I was like, okay, <laughs> fair enough. So uh, that's Tazir punishment. So other things that are, so the, the Hudud are set by the Quran and the Sunnah mainly, but they generally don't apply, get, get applied. That goes to Tazir punishment. Uh, yes. Yeah, so Hudud punishments, there's, there's, it's impossible to get, it's almost impossible to meet the evidentiary bar uh, because the, and we see this, a good example of this with the Quran, right? So the, the Quran gives you punishment of 100 lashes for sexual infraction, but then um, it, in the same text gives you a requirement to have four witnesses. And then if you don't have four witnesses, you get punished 80 lashes. So the Quran itself sets up very severe punishment, but then impossibly high bar to evidence to meet, and then a punishment for not meeting that bar. So it creates a situation I talked about earlier, which is a law that is essentially not meant to be implemented, not because um, it's sort of self-defeating, because the purpose of the law is to deter, to instill a sense of the severity of that crime and to deter the citizenry from committing that crime because pre-modern states don't have the don't have the logistical capacity to invest police and investigate and prevent crimes yeah i did but i can't remember what it is and you have to read my paper on um i mean i could probably i think it was yeah but what was it, it was let's say deterrence value d if you want, to, so this is, this is like a general formula that criminal law scholars would use. If you, this is not Muslims, this is just general criminal law scholars. So we can have a debate about how you deter, did best deter crime. Do you best deter crime by educating kids to be nice people? Or do you best deter crime by scaring people about the punishments they might get? A general rule human beings have had is that you deter people, people from committing crimes by scaring them with the punishments that they're going to get. So D, deterrence value, is... Not that. Uh, P, which is probability of getting caught, times 
uh, S, which is severity of punishment. All right. Now you can imagine if you have a, if you want D of this size, but you're in a pre-modern state. By pre-modern, I mean essentially pre-mid 19th century, before police forces, before things like the telegraph, before automobiles, before taxation systems that are actually able to raise huge amounts of revenue because people have addresses and postal notes and you can go and find where they live and punish them if they don't pay their taxes, right? Before all that, the chances of getting caught are really small. So that's your P. If I want to get a D of that size with a tiny P, how big does S have to be? Yeah, you have to have like a big S. So severity of punishment has to be big in order to get the, the D. Now, you don't actually intend to have those punishments carried out. And I mentioned this before in my last talk. Sorry to those, for those of you who were hearing it again. But this is, you can see this very clearly in the history of English criminal law, which is that punishments, the number of punishments that are death penalty punishments, the number of crimes that are death penalty punishments in England until the year, until the 1820s are, you know, a huge number, some 200 crimes. Some of them just really silly crimes that are punishable by death. Did people actually get executed for those? Not really. Because the juries would find ways to, let's say, okay, you're, you stole a fish from a fish pond. That's death penalty offense, no joke. But, you know, okay, well, you know, it wasn't really a fish you took, it was a sort of a minnow, uh, so we're gonna give you a smaller punishment. So there's the same kind of legal uh, dodges or legal ruses that you see in the Hadoo tradition are actually used in the main elements of criminal law in English law well into the 19th century. Uh, this is only in the case of Hadood law for Islamic law. It's not the case for things like murder and theft. Yes, uh, other questions? Oh, these are, you have the written questions. Just on that point, uh, could you just elaborate on the idea of like, the that you just mentioned now? Uh, yeah, by the way, if you guys want to read this about this, I wrote a whole article called Stoning and Handcutting on Yakin Institute. Org. But uh, the idea that Muslim, the God commands, the, the Prophet is, commands Muslims to, Muslim judges to ward off the Hadood punishments from the believers by looking for ambiguities, by looking for ways out. So unlike things like Sufyan and my tie sale dispute, uh, uh, Feroz and my, dis you know, the issue of him getting beaten up in an alley or something like that, uh, here the judge is supposed to try and do justice. In the case of Hadood crimes, you look for any possible way out of the HUD crime. And it doesn't mean the person isn't going to get punished. It just means that they're going to get punished by the Tazir punishment, not the HUD punishment. 